Hi, I'm Jessica Rector, your host and founder of This Man Thing, where we help men be a truer, better version of themselves and staying in their unique power to gain more freedom, confidence, and success. You can find us at thismanthing.com, and you can also join our free Facebook group at thismanthing.com forward slash groups, where men are having real conversations and building much-needed community, support, and camaraderie with other men. My guest today is Sam Lamelli. He is a former fat kid turned fitness enthusiast who's living his mission of helping others re-engineer their daily habits and take better control of their lives. He's a father, entrepreneur, community builder, and host of the motivational podcast at tipsofthescale.com. When Sam's not spending time with his family or volunteering in his community, he's working to make Tips of the Scale a positive force in the lives of others. Please help me give a warm welcome to Sam. Woo! <laughs> Hi, Sam. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi. Th- I'm glad to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. It's an honor and a pleasure. Yay. So tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got started so we can get to know you a little bit more. Yeah. Well, thanks for, for that awesome introduction. Like, like uh, as you mentioned, I was a, a very nerdy, very overweight kid. Um, so I got picked up, on, uh, picked on um, a lot. I was very insecure as a kid, and I carried that baggage into being an adult. Um, However, losing that weight changed uh, my, my personality, changed a lot about my life. I learned a lot in the process. And so um, those lessons uh, in, in confidence and self-esteem uh, are things I'm trying to help pay forward these days in, in my work with other people and helping them. I'm really passionate about um, helping people who feel powerless or who feel like they're ignored or marginalized by society. I try to reach out to them and help them uh, show them that they're not alone. So how does something like that change your personality? What does that mean? Uh, you mean in, in, in terms of my story or in my yeah. work with people? Okay. So for me, um, so it was kind of a double whammy, right? Being socially awkward because I was, um, my nearest sibling was 10 years older than me. So I was kind of a single child in a way. Yeah. Um, I, I was in, in the GT classes or the advanced classes or whatever as a kid and um, None of my neighbors in my in my community were, so that was kind of a he's off going to a different school. He thinks he's better than this kind of thing, and so that already made me feel like an outsider in two ways. Um, and then being overweight, um, no matter where I went, I got you know stares and comments and things like that. Kids are cruel, right? So we, uh, nice. so I, I I had kind of a, a two three um, whammy against me, um, and I didn't have anybody to turn to at the time. My parents were working really hard, so I was uh, I, I was alone in a lot of ways. Um, and so that was that was my story to myself that I didn't have anyone to turn to. I didn't have anyone to look out for me, to support me, to encourage me. It was I was entirely on my own. So that was my story growing up. Losing the weight um, was something that I couldn't do alone. I learned um, as much as I had tried and dieted and done programs like like lots of people out there have. It wasn't until I enlisted the help of a couple of trusted friends. I was like, look, this is really bothering me. I need help. I'm like being very vulnerable now, right? Like, help me out. I need your help. There's no way I can do this alone. I've tried before. I, I need somebody else. And so there were two guys in high school that um, went went on this. They, they had no reason to be trying to lose weight, but they went along with me um, going to the gym and running. And they were on my, you know, on my back about eating better and stuff. And so losing the weight um, in that kind of collaborative process taught me that people cared, that it was okay to ask for help. Um, and seeing people's, reactions to my outward appearance taught me a lot socially about how you're looked at and automatically judged just based on the way you look. Mm-hmm. And a real quick practical example of that is like, I had, I had had a dozen crushes and infatuations and, you know, junior high and high school, and no one had ever paid me the time of day. I had gotten actually a lot of really mean comments made, like the worst turn off, the worst uh, reply or response or thing. I it was in the eighth grade. It was a, a young girl named Judy. I'll never forget it. She was like, no, you're, you're ugly and, I, and fat and I don't want to have anything to do with you was almost precisely what she said to me. And so I've never forgotten that. Um, and so getting older, losing the weight, um, I noticed that people were paying attention. And even when I wasn't trying to like show my interest or start conversations and stuff like that, I noticed that people were reacting differently, responding differently, holding my eye contact longer. So I learned that you know, how I looked mattered for better or for worse. And so um, a lot of life lessons in the process about how, you know, people engage with me every day, how, um, how I felt about myself and my judgments about people based on how they reacted to me. 
So what I mean by that is like the people who wouldn't talk to me when I was overweight, all of a sudden were cool with being seen with me and being my friends when I had lost weight. So I had judgments about their, you know, their, their, their being genuine or their actual, actual interest in me, if that makes sense. Yeah, because I'm just thinking that how does that, when, uh, when someone says that to you when you're younger, how does that affect how you then start to show up, right? Mm-hmm. I had I had in my head for a long time that the only way that people were going to be interested in me or want to be seen with me, even just as friends, would be if I looked better, that it was all about my appearance. And so for a short while, um, I let my studies slide a little bit because I was focused on working out, exercising, and doing this thing. And thankfully, I, I got my head screwed on right um, to adjust that path before it was too late. But for a while, like my, my number one focus was looking better. Um, and it, 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 was a, it was a bad message. I, I felt um, in my judgment that it was a really bad message for somebody in their formative years, in their teenage years. And that was, and that was a story that I was telling myself just based on how people interacted with me. So my, I have a chip on my shoulder for um, friends, romantic partners, and especially parents who are extra critical of people in their lives who have weight issues or self-esteem issues because this, the, any casual remark can cut really deep when you already have kind of a story you're telling yourself um, about what it takes for people to like you. So for people who are dealing with that, so whether it's kids or adults who are dealing with that, um, what do you say to them to get through that because you're right when people when you're already insecure about those things and then you have people making remarks like that it allows you to keep playing that story over and over and focusing on those things mm -hmm. um, my the place I start from um, which took me a long time to identify and I had to go back and look at journals which I'm so thankful that I did I di I diaried and journaled in my teen years and so I can still look back at those and that's where I learned this um, is that I looked at, identified the things that I was most proud of, what I liked the most about myself, and then I put extra effort into building relationships with people who seemed to appreciate those parts of me. Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoyed comedy, I really enjoyed music, and I really enjoyed like just you know, people who didn't take themselves too seriously, right? And so those, those three things as a teenager were what I connected with other people. I had friends who were in a band, I had friends who loved going to the movies, um, and so I spent more time with them doing things that we enjoyed doing, right? That, that we had in common and that they liked about me because those were the things I liked most about myself. That's where I start to feel, to feel safer. And so I opened up and gradually those are the people that I said, hey, I need your help losing weight. Uh, so that was, that was a starting point for me is identifying what I liked most about myself, which is a really hard, in my judgment, a really hard thing to do with an adult, especially if you've had that tape play in your head for a long time. Um, but that's where I started. But what if you're a kid and or you have kids and they're hearing that from other people? Like whether they're hearing it from other students or other teachers or a, a kid hearing it from relatives. Mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of the same. I, I, this is a place where I, I don't have a lot of experience with dealing with like the, the teenagers. I can only speak from my experience. And that was the same thing to find people that were in tune with the things that I valued most and I enjoyed the most. Mm. I, I can I can tell you looking back that I had um, a bigger social circle in my parents' church than I did at school, mm. and so um, I leaned on the relationships that were new, so that I didn't have kind of a story that they already knew. so they weren't involved in my mental baggage, right? People who'd known me a long time, I felt like already had a story, had a had a a box that they put me in mentally. Yeah. It was people that I met when I was 15 and 16. They had only known me for a couple of years um, that I that were the ones that I built this this bond with and asked ultimately to help me lose weight. I just felt safer with kind of new people. And, I, and you and I, I, yeah. um, I feel like I've experienced this in the, the this man thing group because we're essentially a lot of strangers who just have one thing in common, right? And so me and you and these men from around the, the country are you know, talking about things that we have in common and we don't have anything, uh, we don't have any shared experience before being in this group for the most part. So it's because there's no baggage, just like with these relationships I'm talking about in my teenage years, because there's no prior baggage, I can speak freely and just see where that lands and see who agrees with it and who does it and then just explore those relationships more. 
hope that makes sense. Yeah, but so here's I'm, here's what I'm thinking. So you have the baggage, like for other relationships that have, people who have known you a long time and they have this baggage, right? How do you work through that stuff for them to start seeing you, for them to start seeing you as you and not who they've always seen you as? Because I'm just thinking yeah. that that's going to be something that always stands in your way because you're always playing this role or this person trying to pretend to be this person that maybe you're not. Yeah. This is one of my favorite topics. I'm, I'm writing this down so I don't lose track of it. This is one of the things I tend to get long winded about, but this is where ego is comes, comes into play. Like if I am trying to maintain appearances or trying to stay within the box that someone I've known for a long time has me in, then that can hold me back. And what I mean by that in practical terms is if, is if I've had a friend for, 10 years, 15 years, right? Someone I've known my entire life or whatever. And I'm growing as a person and changing. They can be very skeptical and resistant to the changes they're seeing in me if it's causing friction in our relationship, right? If um, What I see with people who are trying to lose weight, for example, is if they had drinking buddies for years or people that they'd go out to and just they'd go and that, their thing was going out to eat all the time. And if they're trying to change habits and behaviors now that pull them outside of that environment, these friends that they've had for years don't have another way to connect and relate to them. So they get very defensive and very reactive to these changes when it has nothing to do with them. You get what I'm saying? So this is where it's going to take time. There's probably going to be some unpleasantness and ultimately they may lose people. I lost people in this process. Like I, I've been married in the past, divorced. I lost people in that process. Lost, lost weight and had to change kind of my social environment to do that. Same thing, lost friends in the process. But ultimately, the people who stuck with me through all of those changes are the ones that I want to be closest to. So that's this is a hard thing for someone who's never lived through it because it's scary to, to – I, I judge that it's scary to, to lose people. Yeah. Um, especially if you've never been through kind of that weeding out process before and survived it to know that you're going to be okay. Um, that's, that's a scary place to be. Um, so my, my – coming back to your question, it's going to take time of – convincing the people in your life that you are not just doing something different, but you're actually being mm. different. That you're not how just do you do that? Consistency. And they, they have to see that this isn't something you're doing that's going to pass, that it's not just a, a phase or something you're doing because of new people you're associated with, that this is actually a new way of being that you're taking on. Um, and they can choose to go along with your growth and support it and love the new or more fulfilled you. Or if they want to be resistant to it, then – they self-select to go down another path. It's kind of the way I see it. Wow. I mean, I'm just thinking of like how that could be so hard though. You know, and I, I believe that people are not necessarily in our lives for our whole lives. You know, it'd be mm -hmm. nice to go, oh my gosh, I met this person they're in our, our lives forever. I mean, think about the people in, you know, grade school. How many of them do you really talk to that you've You've been friends with forever and yeah. you know, sometimes people are just meant to be in your life for a season a reason a time um, but sometimes saying goodbye to that is is challenging but it also allows you to grow and flourish especially if they're not serving you especially if they're you know thinking you're someone who you really aren't anymore mm -hmm. uh, or maybe who you never were um, mm -hmm. And in becoming a better version of yourself, they either need to be on board with that or you just don't have room in your life for that. So how do you, if, if you're becoming a better version of yourself and people are holding you back from doing that or people want to keep you who, in this box of who they always thought you were, how do you move past that? How do you let go of that relationship, especially if that relationship is family that's the hardest mm, thing you know that yes. you're around family and uh, and a lot of times family can be very very toxic because they taught you know they taught you certain things or they have a certain mindset and and creating a new and different um life for yourself they may not get that they may not understand or they may feel you're going to leave them behind so how do you do that especially if it's family <sighs> The first thing I, I tell people on this topic is to, ex, to not be attached to any outcome other than personal growth. And that means don't put conditions on your journey of, but I need to keep that person in my life, or but I need to keep this job, or I need to keep this relationship, or I need to keep like, 
if you're going to be fully, if you're going to reach a potential, be fully realized as a person, um, this, these are parts of the risks that I believe you have to be willing to take. Is right. You can't be attached to these conditions or these side outcomes. Nothing other than meeting your potential, or if you're a parent or you know within the boundaries of your kids' lives, um, you have to be willing to lose people. You have to be willing to give up things. And so, when it comes to family, um, this is another really interesting topic for me because I have family, close family, sisters, and and a parent that I'm estranged from. And that's because of choices I've made in my life that they didn't agree with and that they, they, they or I have set boundaries for ourselves and we respect those boundaries and so we don't, we don't push them. We, we occasionally gently nudge against them just to see if they're still there and that's it. And so um, I see people, um, I'm going to draw an experience of what I've seen with clients and people who I've interviewed who lost a lot of weight. Uh, Because I see this very frequently. Someone will make changes to their lifestyle and start losing weight. And their husband, their their wife, their spouse, whatever, is not on board. They're they're not willing to give up the sweets. They're not willing to go to the gym with the person every day. And so there's a a rift that starts to form. And the communication is really important. Um, The person who is working to better themselves accepts, I, I believe, accepts the responsibility of setting the other person's mind at ease. Mm, mm-hmm. right? That the reasons they're doing this are not to leave that person behind or they're not going to change their feelings for this other person or that they're not trying to extract, to uh, attract somebody new, things like that. Because those are the things that go through, you know, a spouse's mind, right? Yeah, of course. It's, it's natural. It's human. You cannot help that. So I think there's a responsibility on the person who's working to better themselves to set their partner's mind at ease. Not to say... Yeah, it's cool with me that you're a couch potato, but it's like, I know that it, but it's to say, I know that what I'm doing isn't for you, um, right? Like, it, it's not for you to, something you want to take on, but I want you to know I'm doing it for me and not for anybody else. And I, I still love you. I'm still in this. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. Just the, the, you take on some responsibility to keep their, them at ease. I think that's just a relationship thing. Um, so with family, um, I grew up in a Hispanic house, a Hispanic household community, and so food is a way that we related. A lot of a lot of cultures are like this, right? You get yeah. together for birthdays, for funerals, for weddings, everything. Yes, else. food. Yes. So for people who are trying to change their habits and, and eat less and then be smarter with their decisions and things like that, um, saying no in these culturally pressuring environments is tough. Tough. So so much that some people would rather just not go to the thing and not be faced with it. But ultimately they have to be really, really grounded in why they're doing what they're doing. And um, it sounds how cliche. How do they become grounded? Well, it sounds cliche, but they have to be really connected with their why, right? Why they're making these changes. And this is where I think um, how serious you're, you're taking the changes in your life are, are tested. And what I mean by that is if, if I want to lose weight for this coming summer, just so that I look good on the beach. I don't think that's a strong why. I don't think that's an intrinsic, like an internally powerful reason. So that person's going to get tested with every choice and social decision that they make. And it's going to be a lot easier for them to fall off as opposed to someone who's like, I want to live, you know, an extra 10 years, 20 years to be with my kids. Or I watched my mom die of cancer or watched my dad pass away from heart disease. And I don't want that to be me. That's a strong why there's emotional power in their why. So, being connected with that and remembering that when they're feeling the social pressure makes it easier to put up with that stuff. I, I, I believe, and that's what I've seen with clients too, is if you really have a powerful emotion-driven why, um, you can get through those, those social pressuring environments. Yeah, but that'll also be a lot longer lasting as well. If it's just to look good on the beach, as soon as the summer is over, mm-hmm. you're going to be eating the pizza, you're going to be eating the donut, and mm-hmm. then you'll have to do it again all next year, right? It's yes. It's going to be lasting. Yeah, I work with a, uh, there's a number of people that I consult with and I know in the fitness industry, bodybuilding and stuff like that, and that's that happens there too. They right? work really, really hard to cross that finish line, even marathoners, right? They, they train really hard, cross that finish line. You don't want to know what the next week of their lives looks like because they've been wound so tight, they've been working so hard, and just yeah. the whole emotional release that happens the next week. And I think that's that's natural because if you pull a rubber band too far in one direction, it's going to bounce back, and so... So Sam, help me with this. So 
you know, if you grew up as an overweight, and I'm not talking you specifically, just people in general, grow up as an overweight kid, you start identifying in some way with that, right? right? You start seeing yourself as that. You start asking yourself, you know, am I really good enough? Maybe I'm not good enough because of that rude comment that girl said, um, I, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You start saying that in your head. Um, you start believing that, especially if it keeps getting repeated by different people at different times in your life. You start becoming that, right? And then even to the aspect that you lose weight. Let's say you lose weight, you get health, you get fit. fit. How does that not um, go over into other aspects of your life? So were you say, okay, well, maybe now my weight is under control, but people aren't going to like me because of, you know, A, B, C, or D, that I'm not making as much money as I should, or I don't have that fancy job title, or I'm not driving the fancy car, or those kind of things. How does that not um, go over into other areas? Um, it's a great question. One of the things that I've learned in working with people and in interviewing people who've successfully lost weight is that many of them had the belief that their success in other areas of life, dating, promotions at work, you know, just social stuff, um, were held back by their appearance, by their weight, by their health. And so they had this magical belief, this fantasy that losing the weight is going to solve all their problems. They're going to get the promotion. Yes. They're going to get the guy. They're going to know whatever thing is on the other side of, you know, that, that door that, that is their happily ever after that they're going to get when they lose the weight. And as they get nearer to that, that, that finish line for them, and I don't like that term, but in weight loss, but as they get closer to their goal, their short-term goal, they realize that those things are, are still issues to be fixed. Yeah. Um, and so I find it healthier for people to look at, who they are earlier in the process, how they feel about themselves the stuff that stresses them out and who they want to be. Um, because if they are making the adjustments in their uh, self identity as they're losing the weight, they're in a much better position for the other places in their life that that impacts um, from a mental health perspective. And I'm not an expert on that, but that's been my experience is that the people who believe that losing weight is going to fix everything are in for really rude awakening when they get to their goal range or their goal weight because everything in their life that was a problem still is. Yeah. And, so uh, you mentioned self-identity. What, mm -hmm. what does that look like and how can people find that? Uh, I think it comes back to, to values and what, what you like, you know, what, what, what lights you up, what you find that brings you happiness in life. Um, yeah, you know, I shared for me, it's like comedy. I've been a stand-up com comedy fan for years and like there's nobody I could ever date who, who you know, <laughs> who wasn't into that. And Kristen, my partner, is a huge fan of it. Um, all, all my friends know this is something that is a big deal to me. Um, music is another thing. I play guitar. You know, I want to teach my son that kind of stuff. Um, so those are things that are part of my identity. I love those things. Um, so I... I those things but are important to me. Here's the thing, Sam. I think, I think self-identity is a huge issue among men. I think most men have no clue mm -hmm. on who they are. They don't have any idea who what self-identity means, which is why I was like, gotcha. what does that look like? What is that? Because self-identity is not about your career, right? It's not about your job title. It's not about things you possess, cars, gadgets, any of that. And men tend to identify themselves by those things, money, job title, um, career, climbing the corporate ladder, uh, how many fancy cars they have, those kind of things. Um, and so if they don't have those things, who are they, right? Or yeah. it, who are they outside of being a husband or being a father or being an employer or an employee? They have no idea what it means to self-identify. So that's why, and I'm very passionate about, you can probably tell which is why my <laughs> inflection totally like got up is because I think it's a tragedy in our time that men don't know who they are at their core. You're talking about values. You mentioned it a couple times and yet I bet if you asked men, what are your values? 
they wouldn't have a clue because mm. they don't take time to reflect on the things that are important to them. What they think are important are money, right? If I just have all this money or if I just have this job title, like you said about losing weight, if I just fill in the blank, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be fulfilled. Everything's going to be amazing. It doesn't work like that, which is why you find so many men depressed, uh, miserable, unhappy, uh, committing suicide is because the things that they have worked for their whole lives or the expectations that have been placed on them do not fill them up. And they don't know what fills them up. They don't know how to look for what fills them up. They don't even know what that means. And that's why I think that they have no idea who they are at their core. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what their values are. They don't know what their beliefs are. They've never taken the time to really find out who they are at their core. I, it, this is a huge topic. I um, completely agree. A lot of men are lost on this topic. A lot of people in general are lost on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I started too far downstream. I think the the beginning of self identity is figuring out what you are not. And so it's it's um, cutting things away helps you figure out what you are. I think as you take yeah. things out. So it's important. I'll equate this to dating because it's. I, I tell. I tell. Uh, younger versions of me this all the time, right? You're not going to find... <laughs> I love that, younger versions of me. You're not going to find what you're looking for until you're very clear on what you do not want. Yeah. And there's only one way to figure that out, right? Trial and error. So I think that yeah. self-identity comes through the same process of trying things and figuring out what's not for you. Right? If you want to get um, engaged politically and figure out that that's not for you, now you know that. And you can align those values and those likes and interests with the people you do want to be with. Same thing. If you um, discuss a certain topic with people, you find it, it really makes you uncomfortable. You don't like it, right? You examine the reasons why and figure out maybe that's not for you. Um, but I think that's I think that's part of it. It's just trial and error. You gotta you've got to expose yourself to new ideas, to new circles of people. That's a huge deal. I think mm -hmm. travel, exposure to other cultures and other points of view. Mm -hmm. is one of the best um, ways to figure out who you are, right? Find what you like about those cultures and, and other people and what you don't. And you'll slowly figure out what pieces of each you want to draw upon for the character and the, the man you want to be, the person that you want to become. Um, I, I tell the younger versions of me again, um, and like I, I lost my dad when I was just after turning 20. And so I've collected father figures over the years, bosses, trusted, like older men. I'm in a men's group now with the Mankind Project where we meet every week. And these are, I'm the youngest guy in there. Everybody there is, you know, 40s, 50s. There's a couple guys there in their 70s. I'd learn from these guys every time we talk. And part of the lessons that I get from them is stuff that they don't like that I've never thought about. They're like, yeah, my daughter was saying this. I hate when that happens. And I'll, I'll, I have to question for myself, do I, how do I feel about that topic? How do I feel about that thing? And that helps me form my own opinions. Mm -hmm. and that's where I start to figure out who I really am. Like, how do I feel about this? So on, on identity, um, the short version of all that is expose yourself to new people, new cultures, new environments. Um, find what makes you uncomfortable and what you absolutely don't want in your life. And you slowly chip those things away. And what's left, right, that stone statue that you've torn everything else away from is you. I love that. You know, that's what I did whenever I was in grad school. I was, um, I mean, in relation to what I wanted to do in my career, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no clue. But what I could tell you is what I definitely didn't want to do. Because here's what, here's what I figured out, that if I can't tell you what it is I want to do, at least I can chip away, like you had said, it chip away bits and pieces. And, and I, so I took all these kind of random classes mm -hmm. to see, okay, well, I've always been interested in that. Let me see if I could do that for the rest of my life as a career. Yes. You know, and to figure out what I really, really, really did not want to do and then go, okay, I like that, not as a career, but I like that more of as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And it also allowed me, in the process of doing that, allowed me to find out more about myself too. And what, instead of something just being in my mind, trying it and saying, oh my gosh, I really like that better than I thought I would, or I'm better yes. at that than I thought I would be. Um, and I totally agree with traveling. I'm a huge proponent of traveling. It also allows us 
outside of what you mentioned, it allows us to get outside of ourselves, right? Outside of our small little world and thinking that, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas is the only place in the world that exists and, you know, or even Texas or United States, but it allows us to say, oh my God, there's such a bigger world out there. Why am I limiting myself to just right here? And I think all of us are so guilty of that, just limiting our, ourselves and our thoughts and our um, and what we think we can do. Engaging in, uh, you just you, you sparked my thoughts on something else too, engaging in debate mm. is, is a big deal too, because you don't know where, I never knew where I stood on certain things until people questioned, you know, where are you on this issue, right? As a early, you know, in my early 20s uh, in college, like I, I got into politics in a heavy way. And so I had debates with friends of mine who were totally on the other side of the world in their in their ideology, but we had really good conversations and debates on why each one. Now, I'm not going to get into specific topics, but I had to uh, fortify my positions on things through research and actually asking myself questions based on their trying to chip holes in my and yeah. where I stood. And there are plenty of things where I complete they were I was persuaded. Like over years of maturing and, and looking at things differently, becoming a father, even. I'm completely different from where I was in my early 20s, and it's been through constant like self questioning, like do, why do I believe this? Is it just because that's what I've always been taught, and that's yeah, why I completely exactly. agree with you? Get out of the bubble that you grew up in, the circle of friends that you've always had. Explore new ideas. Be willing to have your ideas chipped at and questioned, and you'll 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 grow. And for you to sit there and ask yourself, well, have I always believed this way just because my parents believe this way or this is the way that I was told to believe or that was quote unquote right? Yeah, I love, ooh, I love that. And I love <laughs> debate. I love debating too. But the other person's got to be of open mind and open heart. Like yes. it's not going to get into a fight. We're not going to sit there and, you know, it's, it's a, conversation where you have to respect my opinion i'll respect your opinion but yet let's go yeah it has to be yeah absolutely there has to be a foundation of like respect and like trust that someone's not going to turn into a personal argument so do this kind of stuff with friends um i wouldn't suggest it with family <laughs> do it with <laughs> do it with friends definitely don't do it on the internet um <laughs> Sit down, sit down with with college buddies, with people, with neighbors, even right. Have a couple of drinks if if that's your thing, and just be like, hey, what do you all think about this thing? And you'd be surprised. You know, you'll learn a lot about the people that you you share your life with. I love that idea, and I don't think I can't remember the last time I've had like a really good debate with with someone about just pull a topic out of thin air and mm -hmm. just talk about it to see not only how they feel, but if there's really legitimacy for how they feel and believe, yeah. and not just because. You may have noticed one of the things I like to do in the our, the our Facebook group, right, in the This Man Thing Facebook group, is when I disagree with what someone's saying, that's the very first thing out of my mouth in the comment, right? Like, I, I think Justin the other day said something, and I said, you know what, I, I completely disagree with the first part of what you said, but blah, blah, blah. And it, that's healthy, I, I think, because the other person's going to ask questions. And so I have to justify my position, but I've also told them right up front, this is how I feel. And so it's, it's I think, a thoughtful exchange of ideas. We don't necessarily, are, 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 we're not necessarily trying to change each other's opinions or persuade each other, but that's a good way for me um, to practice speaking my mind. Yeah. And uh, to be gently challenged in my assumptions when people ask questions back. So that's, that's my approach is like, speak your mind and just see where it lands, see what people ask, but be be respectful at all times, obviously. But I also like to hear other perspectives because maybe I've just been in my own world and in my own mm -hmm. mind too long. And I love hearing, I may not agree with you, but I can absolutely say, you know what? I don't agree with you, but I can see how you would think that or feel that way. Or, you know, I've never thought of it like that way before. <laughs> as a, You know, as opposed to me just thinking my way's right, my way mm -hmm. is the way I'm going to keep thinking, you know, it allows me to go, okay, I've never thought of it like that before. And I think um, some of the power is in the group is when questions are proposed, that could be kind of hot topic, quote unquote, questions or whatever, mm -hmm. to get differing degrees of opinions. And it's almost like you push like a hot button and people get passionate about it, respectfully passionate about it, right? Mm -hmm. Passionate about what they're saying. But I think an exchange of ideas in a healthy way like that is really good. And I personally don't get that enough in my real life. Like mm -hmm. I'm not sitting there having like healthy debates with 
with girlfriends or with, you know, whenever I'm doing like this man thing events, like we're not sitting there having healthy debates, but I think it's good because you get different viewpoints. Something I'll, um, I, 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 you, you, two things I wanted to say. You reminded me of a couple of times that your, your response to something I've said has been, I can see how you would feel that way or where you're coming from because of your past history on XYZ. So it's a total, like, I get where you're coming from because I understand your history. And so that's, um, it's a very clear, like, I don't necessarily, necessarily agree, but I see where you're coming from. So that's an exchange of ideas, right? You're putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and getting their perspective. I think I, there's not enough places online, especially where people do that. I think that's very healthy. I, that's, I think that's a huge plus of our group that, that you do that. The other thing, um, I've said this to somebody recently, but when, when someone says to another person, how's, your, how's it going, how's your day? Uh, there's a lot of people who say that just as a greeting, as a pleasantry, and they don't really want to know. Mm -hmm. I've made it a habit over the years to like, if you're going to ask the question, I'm going to, I'm going to answer yeah. it. Honestly. So I, there's been times where I'm like, it's been a crappy month. <laughs> and I may leave it at that or I may like add, you know, ABC behind it. And this is where I, I dive into new territory with people. If they weren't expecting that, you know, the obvious follow up, if you're being polite is, well, why, what's going on? I'll ask, you know, I'll answer ABC and then we'll actually get into something real and not just, yeah. a, oh, how's it going? It's great. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Things are going great at home. Wife and kids, blah, blah. And that's very surface. I don't get to bond with somebody that way. But when, when someone actually asks a question, I see that the door's been opened and we have a real conversation. So that's something I suggest to people also is if they're trying to form better relationships, especially with other men who aren't used to being heard on how are you actually feeling, is when someone asks, how's it going, man? How are you? How's, how's the family? Ask, a, you know, be honest and vulnerable on your side and then ask a, a, a probing question. Be like, hey, I use this example, I think in our group actually, um, I said something I suggest is when someone uh, doesn't look okay, just say so. Just hey, and the example I used was saying, uh, hey Bob, I noticed when you all arrived at my party that you know Katie was giving you kind of the side eye and you all didn't arrive happy. What's up with that? Like you're being very direct and yeah. man may need to talk about it. And he showed up at the thing prepared to just put on a front and be like nothing was wrong. But if you genuinely ask, what's going on? I wanna hear you is the message I think that conveys. That opens the door for some real dialogue, hopefully letting the guy vent and getting somewhere where you two are gonna, gonna bond. I think that's healthy, no matter do you, what Do you think men would respond though with what's really going on, as opposed to keeping that wall up, especially to another man? Because I think that is part of the challenge that men have grown up and they're taught not to talk about emotions and feelings, right? Mm -hmm. They're talking, they're, hey, what's going on really means Oh, things are great. Oh, yeah. yeah, let me just put on that mask and act like life's wonderful and amazing, even though all these, you know, challenges or struggles or issues are coming up. Um, do you think men would really answer honestly and allow themselves to be vulnerable? Or a better question would be, how can men get the courage to do that? Hmm. Getting the courage up to is, is, the, is the rub. Um, you kind of have to be willing to be ignored. You have to be willing to be brushed off. Like, this is where it comes back to ego for me. Is that it? one of the three life lessons I try to like give the younger versions of myself is that you're not for everyone. So if and I, I'm trying to teach this to my my son who just turned four, um, is that if he says hi to somebody or hey I want to play with my toy and that kid doesn't say hi back, I've seen him go why didn't he say hi daddy? Why didn't he want to play with him? My son does the same thing. He's four. It's it's devastating as an adult to see him like questioning himself or, or being hurt but the, the answer my answer to him is not everybody's going to say hi not everybody's nice and that's okay that doesn't mean that you're not a good boy you're not a nice boy you keep on being you you keep on doing you son and all day you know he's over it in like three seconds and he's fine but as an adult the same the same message is i believe is true you're not for everybody you have to be willing to have the occasional person give you the brush off answer or be like yeah i'm fine don't worry about it man and just walk walk off and be cold that's his stuff it doesn't reflect on me um so in my experience, uh, like three, three out of four times that I ask that question, I'm going to get an honest, like I'm going to get somebody who's surprised to have heard the question and we're going to have a good dialogue. And that fourth person, I'm like, okay, cool. We could have had a good conversation, but they don't want to. That's their choice or decision. I'm not attached to that outcome. So, you know, good luck to them. They, they missed out. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, I'm glad you have such great results. And I think the more men who ask that of other men, the more that, A, it gives them permission to keep asking it of other men, mm -hmm. but it also gives the recipient 
permission to answer in an honest way and then to be truthful and with themselves of what's really going on and to step into that. So what is one thing that people can start doing today to, I mean, we talked about all these different things. So, you know, I don't even know where you want to go <laughs> with this answer. Cause I don't know where I'm really going with the question of, you know, I want people to uh, listen to this and be able to take one action. So whether it's pertaining to, you know, weight loss, whether it's self-reflection, self-identity, um, what is, you know, after someone hears this today, what is something that they can do and they can start immediately? At the root of everything I believe, everything I've discovered in becoming an adult and now father, um, and everything that I teach and I, I discover and work with my clients, um, at the bottom of everything is that um, you have to step through fear you have to step through the things that make you uncomfortable to get to, some, to, to true growth. And it's okay. This is the big one. It's hard for me even today. It's okay to ask for help. Yes. There's nothing wrong. There's no – asking for help doesn't mean you're not enough, right? That we've had a conversation in the group about that term and how, how the stigma with that. But it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to reach out and tell people that you trust or to ask for people to find somebody that you trust to say, Hey, I need help. Here's what I need. Yeah. Can you help? Um, whether it's trying to lose weight, whether it's trying to save a failing relationship, whether it's um, struggling on the job, whether it's just like, you don't feel like you have a purpose in life, whatever it is, uh, there are people, I promise, no matter where you are, what your circumstances are, there are people who are willing to talk to you about it. So look out, reach out for them and ask. Do not be afraid to ask. And again, you're not for everybody. So not everyone's going to be in your corner, but you'll never find the ones who are until you ask. Yes. And that brings up a really great point of something that you put in the group one time is be direct in your ask. Like don't skate around. Don't tell some story and expect someone else to know that you're really asking for help in that store. Like by sharing some story, mm -hmm. like just be direct and say, I need help. Will you help me? Or how, where can I go and get help if you don't even know where to start, but you know, don't beat around it and then be mad or disappointed or upset that they didn't know that what you really were asking for is help when you didn't even say, I need help. Yeah, I appreciate it. Mind, right? Absolutely. And I, this is one of the things I appreciate about the way they run the group too, is that you ask people to clarify so that they, they're kind of forced to be direct. Because I mean, we're, I'm getting older every day, right? Every second that passes, I'm yeah. getting older. So I don't have time to figure out what you're trying to say. So I'm going to be direct with you and respect for your time and your your life on this planet, right? You only have so many minutes, so yeah. I'm going to respect that time by being direct with you, and I want the same. Well, so. and I also know <laughs> that I may be interpreting it a different way than you're interpreting it, just because not only am I a different person, but because I'm a female and you're a male, and it's going to land on me maybe differently than other mm -hmm. people, so I want to make sure that before I respond, I want to make sure I'm very clear on what you're saying and your intention of what you're saying. So yeah. tell us, Sam, how we can find out more about you and how we can connect with you. Yeah, sure thing. My, my blog and podcast, uh, my podcast about habit change and weight loss are, is at tipsofthescale.com. Um, anyone can reach out to me and I'd love to hear from the This Man Thing audience. Um, you can find me at sam at tipsofthescale.com. I'm happy to talk with you. Even if weight loss isn't your thing, you just want to chat about something you heard on you know, on this conversation, um, or you want a, a vouch for how awesome the, this man's group is, uh, I'm happy to do that too. Uh, it's a great place, recommended highly for any guy in any phase of life. Um, but again, you can reach me at sam at tipsofthescale.com. Awesome. And you know, not that we're going to go on talking about this subject, but I do want to mention, and I don't know how you feel about this, um, but I believe weight loss is not really about weight loss. I believe weight loss is about um yes like shedding the pounds but it's so much more than weight loss and so if there's meaning just to clarify mm -hmm. meaning that weight loss is is really about you getting healthy it's about you standing in your power you valuing yourself not only your body but your mental and um, your mental health as well and so for me when you know, just, and I just say this because for, for someone who's listening, who's struggling with weight, it's not about the weight. It's about what led you to the weight to begin with. And it's about the struggles that you may be having underneath the weight, meaning the struggles you're having and you're choosing to eat 
yeah. instead of dealing with the emotions, dealing with the feelings. And so if you have questions um, about that or if you're, that's like <laughs> clear as mud, anything like that, please reach out to Sam because he can, he can answer all those questions and get you on the right track of not only your weight loss but really about – um, about getting your mind right and dealing with the issues because uh, being overweight is the um, symptom. It's not really the problem. And so exactly. you've got to kind of combine that. Would yeah. you agree? Absolutely right. It's um, my show My show on podcast and blog are all uh, – I say targeted at people who have 50 or 80 or more pounds to lose because, you know, someone who's trying to lose 10 or 15, that those are little – tweaks you can make in a day a little habit change things but someone who's got a lot more to lose typically um, not always but typically has a lot more serious like quality of life issues right like what are the things that are stressing you out what are the things that you're trying to escape suppress deny hide or feed with food yeah so it's a lot deeper conversations than just like what to eat and how much to exercise thank you yeah, for that. love it well, thank you so much again for being on today. Sam, we could have kept talking about a million <laughs> different things. So I appreciate it. You'll have to come back on another Happy time. And we can continue the conversation to lots of different areas. Again, I'm Jessica Rector, your host and founder of This Man Thing, where we help men be a truer, better version of themselves and stand in their unique power to gain more freedom, confidence, and success. You can join our Facebook group, which Sam mentioned several times today, at thismanthing.com forward slash groups and join our real conversations and you'll also get the much needed community support and camaraderie with other men you will be accepted and loved and appreciated just for you being you you be you that's all we want you can also connect with me at jessica at this man thing.com or go to our website at this man thing.com we look forward to seeing you next time having you on and until then have a fabulous amazing day bye-bye